Before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, um, as with previous rounds of hearing, uh, those who've been given leave to appear have been notified and uh, those parties have then indicated uh, who will be appearing for them. Uh, there is therefore no occasion to take or announce appearances. Uh, for this round of hearings, there was a large number of applications for leave to appear, uh, which I did not allow. And although the solicitors have written uh, to those applicants trying to explain why I got to that answer, uh, I just want to add something now because I think it's very important. Almost all of the applications uh, that were refused were by individuals who want to say that they too have been affected by conduct of a kind that falls within the terms of reference. It was conduct relating to dealings uh, with small or medium enterprises. I understand that they want to have what happened to them uh, publicly examined and publicly acknowledged. Many of those uh, who sought leave but were refused uh, have made online submissions. I encourage any of them who have not uh, to take that step <coughs> because those online submissions form a, an important, I would say very important part <coughs> of the material that has been, is being, will continue to be considered by the Commission. We've now received more than 5,500 uh, online submissions. We do read them. We digest them. And we do learn from them. But I remain of the view that proceeding by way of case studies, as we have in the past and will in this round of hearings, is the best way of finding out what has happened, finding out what was done or not done in response to what happened, trying to identify what could have been done, what should have been done in response and then thinking about what follows from those conclusions. Mr Hodge. Commissioner, today we commence the third round of public hearings. These hearings will explore issues in relation to small and medium enterprises in their dealings with financial services entities, and particularly in relation to the provision of loans. There will be a particular focus on small businesses, on how we define them and the extent to which we ought to regulate the provision of credit to them. This module will not include consideration of lending to farmers. Lending to farmers will form a part of, or one part of the next round of hearings for module four. As will become apparent during the course of these hearings, Business loans raise very different issues to home loans. <clears throat> a bank is generally subject to fewer obligations in determining the appropriateness of a business loan when compared <coughs> with the making of a home loan. That is the case even for loans to small businesses. And that is, as we will explain, the approach that is desired by significant voices in the small business community. The concern is that to impose responsible lending obligations on banks when lending to small businesses would dry up or further dry up the provision of credit to small businesses. There is also a significant difference between the circumstances in which a business loan might be enforced and the circumstances in which we would expect a home loan to be enforced. An issue raised in various forums and in many public submissions to this commission is banks taking enforcement action because of non-monetary defaults. That is, the borrower has made whatever payments of principal and interest it is the borrower is required to make, but is in default because, for example, the loan-to-value ratio 
of the security for the loan has been breached or the borrower's earnings have fallen below a minimum interest cover. When compared with the circumstances in which a home loan might go into default, it might seem surprising that a bank would rely upon a non-monetary default in a business loan to take default-based action. However, non-monetary defaults need to be considered in the particular context of the particular business loan. Take, as a simplified example, a loan for property development. It may be the case that a facility is to be paid out when the development is completed. If the market changes and the value of the property falls, then the loan to value ratio may be breached and the bank and the borrower may have to confront the risk that if the property falls any further, it will not be possible to pay out all creditors, including the bank, when the development is completed. Now, perhaps the market will recover in the immediate future, perhaps it will not. The question will be, what should the bank and the borrower do in those particular circumstances? How should the risk be managed? And does this give rise to issues in relation to whether or not the conduct is either misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations? Having regard to those and other distinctions between personal lending and business lending, there are at least three overarching questions that we expect that you will wish to consider during the course of this module. First, what obligations in relation to responsible lending ought to apply to small businesses? Secondly, in what circumstances might the exercise by a bank of default-based contractual rights become unfair, unconscionable, or below community standards when the relevant loan is a small business loan or a business loan? Thirdly, how have the banks and the regulators responded to calls for higher standards for dealings with small business and the introduction of legislative prohibitions on unfair terms in small business contracts? In this opening submission, we will traverse a number of topics that we hope will assist the Commission, the public, and those that have been granted leave to appear to understand better the case studies that will be explored over the following two weeks together with the background and purpose for this exploration. The first topic that we will look at is to provide a snapshot of the scale of small business in Australia to contextualise the importance of this topic to the Australian economy. Secondly, we will briefly explore the funding sources for small businesses in Australia. Third, we will explore some of the prevailing definitions of small business. Fourth, we will explain some of the key features of the regulatory framework in which lending to small business occurs, including upcoming reforms and access to redress mechanisms. Fifth, we will summarise what small business owners have told the Commission about their experiences with financial services entities. Sixth, we will touch on what regulators and other bodies working in this area, such as ASIC and the Financial Ombudsman Service, have told the Commission. Seventh, we will summarise what past reviews and inquiries have found, including those of the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprises Ombudsman, or Small Business Ombudsman. Eighth, we will make some observations about our approach to cases related to Bank West and its takeover by CBA. Ninth, we will consider what financial services entities have acknowledged to the Commission as to their own misconduct and conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations in relation to small businesses. Tenth and finally, we will briefly introduce the case studies to be explored in this round of hearings. We will return to highlighting the potential themes and questions that are likely to emerge for close consideration by you. I start then with the first topic, small businesses in Australia. The Australian Bureau of Statistics defines a small business to be one with less than 20 employees. Data from the ABS shows that at the end of the 2017 financial year, there were just under 2.2 million businesses in Australia that would fall into that category. This represents 97.5% of all businesses at the relevant time. Of those 2.2 million businesses, 1.37 million had no employees, Small and medium enterprises are also significant employers within certain sectors of the economy. In 2015 to 2016, 
Small businesses with 20 employees or less employed 4.7 million people in Australia, which represents 44% of the total number of people employed in the private sector in Australia. Small businesses are the predominant private sector employer in the agriculture, forestry, fishing and construction industries. A number of the case studies that we will deal with in the following week, two weeks deal with or involve franchises. According to the Franchise Council of Australia's 2016 report, the number of franchise businesses operating in Australia also continues to grow, having almost doubled over the past 20 years. In 1998, there were approximately 44,000 franchise businesses operating in Australia. By 2016, that had risen to approximately 79,000. As at 2016, almost half a million Australians were employed in the franchising sector. Most, though not all, of the case studies that you will hear about involve the closure of a business. There is little robust data on the causes of closure in small, of small businesses in Australia. It is important to note, first, that a small business ceasing to trade is not necessarily synonymous with business failure. Many businesses cease to operate on their own terms. In its 2015 inquiry report on business setup, transfer and closure, the Productivity Commission found that over 90% of business exits are not the result of formal insolvency and the majority are voluntary and do not involve business failure. In the same report, the Commission also observed that voluntary business exits include successful exits, such as selling the business for a profit or merging with another business. ABS data shows that more employees, that the more employees a business has, the more likely it is to survive. The second topic that I now turn to is the availability of funding, which of course is going to be critical for many small businesses from inception to operation. There is little data available on lending to small business, but RBA data published in December 2017 suggests that approximately 27% of the aggregate value of credit provided by banks to all businesses in Australia is provided by way of facilities in respect of which the credit outstanding is $2 million or less, and it might be inferred that for facilities of less than $2 million, that's more likely to be a small business than a large business. Banks are the main source of lending for businesses in Australia, with 90.5% of commercial finance commitments in January 2008 being made via banks. ASIC has further observed that the majority of small business customers are with the four major banks. A recent Productivity Commission inquiry found that initial funding for new businesses, whether debt or equity, was usually provided by the personal resources of business founders, that is by personal savings, personal credit cards, or equity in personal assets such as real estate. However, many new businesses also seek finance from banks in the form of business loans, trading facilities and overdrafts, and including on the basis of personal capital or equity being provided. In this way, small business lending is often intermingled with the finance of the business owner or the owner's family. For example, although precise data is not read, readily available, the Productivity Commission's draft report into competition in the Australian financial system cites data that shows that around 80% of the value of small business lending by the major banks was secured by some form of real estate. Data provided by the major banks to the Productivity Commission shows that around 33% of all small business lending by the major banks is secured by residential property. And these figures illustrate the importance of providing security to the ability of small business entrepreneurs being able to access finance. The third topic we will address is one that has vexed many regulators and industry participants. How is a small business defined? A related question is what purpose is served by a definition of small business? Small businesses are defined in various pieces of legislation and industry codes for the purpose of providing certain protection, rights or benefits to businesses that fall into whatever is the defined category. These protections, rights and benefits accrue to the small businesses that meet that relevant definition but not to any other businesses. And legislation and industry codes often use different definitions of small businesses. 
generally Commonwealth statutes employ definitions of small business that turn upon the number of employees. In the Corporations Act, for example, small business is deemed to be ones that have less than 20 employees or 100 employees in the case of manufacturers. And they are deemed to be retail clients in relation to insurance and other financial products or services for the purpose of Chapter 7 of the Act. However, that approach is not used consistently throughout legislation. In some cases, there is little distinction drawn between different sizes of business, while in others, small businesses may be treated as retail clients or even as consumers. In addition to the number of employees, the scope of legislative protection may be limited by reference to the value of the contract in question. And the recently extended unfair contract terms regime in the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act applies to businesses that employ less than 20 employees or 100 employees for manufacturing businesses where the contract has either an upfront price of less than $300,000 or in the case of a contract which has a duration of more than 12 months, the contract price is less than $1 million. Other legislation uses the annual turnover of an entity to determine whether the entity is a small business. The Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman Act provides for an ombudsman with advocacy and assistance functions in relation to small businesses that have less than 100 employees and an annual revenue of $5 million or less. The Income Tax Assessment Act provides access to certain concessional treatments in the tax laws for small business entities which have an annual turnover of less than $10 million. In contrast, the prohibition on unconscionable conduct in the ASIC Act is not limited by any of these factors. It applies to the acquisition of financial services by any business that is not a listed public company. These definitions are also replicated in, volunta in voluntary industry codes, such as the current Australian Banking Association's Code of Banking Practice, which adopts the Corporations Act definition of small business. And that code is in turn linked or used in internal bank policies. Westpac, for example, applies its financial hardship policy to customers with a total committed exposure of up to $1 million and to customers that satisfy the Code of Banking Practices definition of small business. Some debate has arisen in recent years about this apparent inconsistency in the, and the plethora of definitions across the legislative landscape. However, in its 2013 research report into regulator engagement with small business, the Productivity Commission found little merit in the idea of merging into a single harmonised definition for small business, noting that this could lead to inflexibility and higher costs. It concluded that policymakers and regulators are best placed to define small business for their regulatory area. This returns to the second question we noted above. What purpose is served by a definition of small business and having regard to what has been found by the Productivity Commission, what is the particular legislative regime under consideration? Ultimately, whichever approach is adopted, the rationale for delineating small, smaller business entities from larger ones is to extend certain consumer protections or akin protections to entities that may be relatively unsophisticated and lacking in the bargaining power and resources of a larger entity, such as access to lawyers or specialist advisors. For example, where a business is a sole trader, it is owned and run by one person, the sole trader is personally responsible for the debts of the business, and there is no legal distinction between the sole trader and the business. In other circumstances, small businesses are undertaken through a company in which one person is the sole shareholder or in which all of the shares are held by members of one family. As already noted, there is extensive use of personal assets such as the family home to secure a business loan. Such traits may make small businesses akin to consumers in the power imbalance that they are under when negotiating with and dealing with financial services entities. Therefore, they may be in need of the same or similar protections against misconduct that are afforded to consumers. But if such protections are extended, what will be the costs and consequences for small businesses? Will it lead to a reduction in the availability of credit? And if so, why? <coughs> will it lead to an increase in the cost of credit because of an increase in the risk of lending by the entity? The fourth topic 
to which I will now turn is the legal framework in which small business lending takes place. The Commission's background paper number 10, Credit for Small Business, an overview of Australian law regulating small business loans by Andrew Godwin, Jeannie Marie Patterson and Nicola Howell of Melbourne University Law School, provides a great deal of detail on the legislative and regulatory regimes applicable to small business and is available on the Commission's website. The Commission's background paper number 11, Request for Information Reforms to Small Business Lending by Treasury, identifies reforms affecting SME lending that have been introduced since 2007. The Commission welcomes comments on the papers which may be provided to the Office of the Solicitor assisting the Commission. As will be apparent from those papers, there is little regulation of small business lending in Australia. There are no legislative codes or protections that are specifically directed to small businesses in Australia. As we have already said, the responsible lending obligations under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act do not apply to small business credit products. Proposals to extend that regime to small business credit have previously been considered but not adopted or recommended mainly due to concerns expressed by small business representatives that such a move would restrict flexibility on the part of lenders and therefore limit the access of small businesses to credit. Since the GFC, the conversation on regulating small business in Australia has focused on questions about the appropriate balance between access to credit and imposing standards on the provision of that credit to protect borrowers. We have heard from a range of stakeholders including the Small Business Ombudsman and the Council on Small Business Australia, that there is a correlation between regulatory burden and the ability of small businesses to have access to credit, including increased credit costs for access to that credit. Further adding to the complexity of the regulation of small business lending is the question of how sophisticated and well-resourced small business operators can be expected to be in relation to seeking credit and dealing with situations of default. However, there are some protections that apply to small business lending. The ASIC Act applies to provide protection against misleading and unconscionable conduct. What constitutes unconscionable conduct in a finance to business context will be determined by a court on a case by case basis, which may have regard to a range of circumstances. But it is undoubtedly the case that a high bar is generally imposed by courts when a commercial borrower alleges that a lender has acted unconscionably. The mere existence of a disparity in bargaining power does not make the conduct of the stronger party in promoting its own interests unconscionable. The ASIC Act also implies a number of terms into contracts for the supply of financial services to consumers. Somewhat confusingly, the ASIC Act then defines acquisition in connection with a small business to be acquisition by a consumer and in that way, the end result is that there are mandatory warranties in contracts for the supply of financial services to small businesses, that A, the services will be rendered with due care and skill, and B, that the services will be reasonably fit for any purpose or required result made known to the supplier by the consumer. In 2015, Parliament also extended the unfair contract terms provisions of the ASIC Act to standard form small business contracts entered into or renewed on or after 12 November 2016. Small businesses usually enter into loan agreements through standard form contracts. That is, the terms are not subject to negotiation and they are offered on a take it or leave it basis. The 2016 reforms were generally supported by consumer advocacy organisations, but small business organisations and the financial and leasing sectors raised concern with the extension of the regime to small businesses on the basis that it would increase burden and lending costs. The unfair contract terms provisions apply, as I've said already, where the upfront price payable does not exceed $1 million if the contract is for longer than 12 months, as would most often be expected in the case of lending. Following the commencement of the unfair contract term reforms, ASIC and the Small Business Ombudsman conducted a review of small business loan contracts of up to $1 million offered by the four major banks. Following this intervention, the four major banks agreed in August 2017, some eight months after the commencement of the amendments, to further change the standard terms in their small business loan contracts by removing a number of standard clauses, including entire agreement clauses, broad indemnification clauses, 
unilateral variation clauses and financial, financial indicator covenants, save for in respect of certain specialised industries, such as property development. Evidence will be presented in these hearings as to the oversight by ASIC of the legislative changes and their implementation by affected entities. The four major banks also agreed to extend unfair contract term protections from the $1 million required by legislation to loans of up to $3 million. In making this announcement, the small business ombudsman, Kate Carnell, noted that recent reviews have consistently raised that a small business loan facility of $5 million is the correct benchmark, including her own inquiry into small business lending. General law doctrines such as the law of contract may also apply to small business contract transactions, and these duties will of course exist alongside statutory obligations. Given the small number of specific protections relating to small business lending, borrowers must largely rely on self-regulation by the banks to provide additional protections. The Code of Banking Practice is a voluntary code published by the Australian Banking Association that has been adopted by most banks offering retail products in Australia, including credit, credit products. Although the code does not have the force of law independently, the terms of the code may form a part of any contract that a subscribing bank enters into with its customers and will apply to loans to small business where the business falls within the definition of small business contained in the code. A key provision of the current code is clause 27 by which a bank undertakes to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and informing an opinion about the customer's ability to repay the credit facility before giving or increasing such a facility. Other important provisions concern the obligations on banks in procuring guarantees of small business loans. The protections include an obligation to give a prominent notice in relation to various matters before the guarantee is taken, including that the guarantor should seek independent legal and financial advice on the effect of the guarantee. The bank must also tell the guarantor about certain matters, such as the service of a notice of demand on the debtor and provide copies of the credit contract and other documents. In a decision of the Victorian Court of Appeal in Doggett and the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, in which an earlier version of the code was considered, it was held that the equivalent of Clause 27 was a relevant provision under the equivalent of Clause 31.3, which applies the code to guarantees and was therefore incorporated into the terms of the guarantee. As a result, guarantors have the right to rely on a bank's promise to act as a diligent and prudent banker in assessing the relevant loan before its approval. Non-compliance with the banking code can be examined by the Banking Code Compliance Monitoring Committee. Banks that have adopted the Banking Code are required to report to this committee about their compliance on an annual basis. Although at present, there are few sanctions available to the committee in respect of breaches of the Banking Code. A small business can rely on an applicable breach of the code as a breach of its contract with the relevant bank and seek the intervention of the committee. The first witness from whom the Commission will hear evidence today will be Mr Philip Curry, who conducted an independent review of the code in 2016 and 2017. Shortly after Mr Curry's report was published, it was announced that a revised code would provide small business customers with longer notice periods around changes to loan conditions or a bank's decision whether to renew a loan facility, as well as simpler contracts. In addition, the revised code will be compulsory for all members of the ABA. In December 2017, the ABA announced that a revised code had been provided to ASIC for approval. This is the first time ASIC has been asked to approve the code, which means it must meet the criteria for codes in the financial services set out in section 1101 capital A Corporations Act and ASIC's regulatory guide 183, including in relation to compliance monitoring and enforcement. The revised code has not yet been approved and before these hearings, the drafts had not been made public. The state of the code and its contemplated approval by ASIC will be considered in a case study next week. Access to redress for small business customers is an issue of ongoing reform by the government. It has been the topic of significant consideration in recent years, including the report of the Ramsey Review, which we will discuss further. <coughs> 
partly due to the existence of jurisdictional and compensation caps that can operate to exclude small business from alternative dispute resolution and leave costly court action as the only option for redress of a business that has a dispute with its bank. Small businesses that have less than 20 employees or 100 employees in the case of manufacturers are included in the definition of retail clients in the Corporations Act, which means they must be covered by an internal dispute resolution procedure. Small businesses may also have, as have access to an ASIC approved external dispute resolution scheme if the lender is an Australian credit licensee. Lenders that do not provide consumer credit are not required to hold an Australian credit license and are therefore not required to belong to an EDR scheme. The consequence of this is that small businesses that borrow from non-bank lenders will not have access to an EDR scheme. The two EDR schemes that presently deal with small business lending are the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman. From 1 November 2018, there will be a single EDR scheme for financial complaints, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. FOS and CIO presently have overlapping functions. The ability of a business to take a dispute to one or the other body will depend on the scheme and the financial services provider. Both FOS and the CIO may consider disputes between a financial services provider that is a member of their scheme. FOS may not consider a dispute under the following conditions where the value of the applicant's claim in the dispute exceeds $500,000, or where the dispute is about debt recovery against a small business where the contract provides for a credit facility of more than $2 million. CIO may not consider a dispute under similar conditions where the value of the claim exceeds $500,000, or the financial services provider had before the complaint was received by the CIO commence legal proceedings against the small business complainant in relation to a credit facility having a credit limit of more than $2 million. There is also a limit on the amount of compensation that FOS and CIO can provide, which is set by ASIC and aligned to the retail client definition set out in the Corporations Act and regulations. The current limit on compensation is $323,500. FOS and CIO will have their jurisdiction taken over by the new Australian Financial <coughs> Complaints Authority which will have jurisdiction to hear small business disputes. AFCA will have expanded jurisdiction because it will have an expanded definition of small business, which will be any business with fewer than 100 staff and will be able to consider disputes or claims in relation to credit facilities of up to $5 million. It will also have an expanded compensation cap of $1 million for small businesses and $2 million for primary producers. Commissioner, the fifth topic that we will now address is information that we have received from members of the public in relation to business lending. As at 5 p.m. on Friday, 18 May 2018, the Commission had received 5,540 submissions from Australians through the Commission's website, a figure that is up significantly from the approximately 1,850 submissions that had been received at the time of the first public hearing in February. Over 2,000 of the additional submissions have been received since the opening of the second round of public hearings on 16 April. Just over 11% of the public submissions received to date have indicated that they relate to small business financial dealings, totalling 633 submissions. Within the 633 submissions, five key issues have been most frequently raised. First, a large number of submissions raise concerns about the process for assessing and approving applications for credit made by small businesses. Many of the submissions identify concerns about loans or other credit having been provided to small businesses without the relevant financial services entity first undertaking a proper assessment of the viability or profitability of the small business and its capacity to service the credit product on offer. Next, some Australians have raised concerns about the circumstances in which they have provided personal guarantees or use their family home as security for their business loan and the consequences that follow from such requirements. Thirdly, the Commission has received a number of submissions from the public which raise concerns about the processes for rolling over or renewing business facilities. These submissions highlight concerns about the imposition of additional conditions 
as a condition precedent to rollover and the period of notice that has been given by financial services entities of a decision not to renew the relevant facility. Fourthly, many submissions received by the Commission concern business loans that have been placed in default or terminated for breach of non-monetary obligations by the borrower such as reporting obligations or loan-to-value ratio covenants. These submissions raise concerns about business facilities being terminated even where the business has continued to make all payments due and owing under the facility on time. Finally, the Commission has received a large number of submissions concerning the availability of adequate dispute resolution mechanisms for small businesses in their dealings with financial services entities. These submissions suggest that many small business owners who are in dispute with a financial services entity are forced to walk away from their business as they cannot afford to pursue court proceedings. In the case studies which will be presented over the next two weeks, evidence will be presented on a number of these themes. Many of the themes were also identified in a submission received by the Council of Small Business Australia. In its submission, the Council raised concerns about behaviours and practices engaged in by the enforcement and recovery teams within financial services entities and the effect that these behaviours and practices have on the mental health and wellbeing of small business owners. It was evident from the public submissions and individuals that we have spoken to in the course of preparing for these hearings that the effect of business lending issues can extend beyond the borrower. The Commission was told by a number of consumer advocacy bodies, including legal aid officers, of examples of the effect on family members of small business lending issues, particularly parents guaranteeing small business loans for their children using their homes as security. In such situations, there are questions to be asked about whether guarantors fully understand the risks associated with providing the guarantee once the business gets into financial difficulty. In some circumstances highlighted by Legal Aid Queensland, guarantors were not told of extensions of business facilities for which they are providing security. Guarantees are often older Australians who can then face repossession of their homes when the banks seek to enforce these guarantees in the event that the bank fails. This can also lead to conflict between the rights of obli and obligations of the borrower and the rights and obligations of the consumer who has provided the guarantee, which can place, obviously enough, immense pressure on familial relationships. The Commission also heard about the importance of the business relationship between the bank and the SME customer. In particular, there were many submissions that evidenced a view that the further away from the branch the loans were managed, the less satisfactory the outcomes to borrowers. An associated issue that was raised by a number of individuals and entities is the management of businesses in difficulties by individuals located in bank central offices who have limited knowledge of the individual business or its circumstances. The South Australian Business Commissioner noted that local account management is a thing of the past and there is no local knowledge or understanding of the business and its needs. The sixth topic that we will now address is the work of Australian regulators in this area and the observations that they have shared with, com with the Commission over the past six months. ASIC's work in respect of small business lending has been primarily limited to overseeing the implementation of the unfair <coughs> contract terms legislation and in administering consumer protection provisions that apply to small business, such as the unconscionable conduct provisions in the ASIC Act. ASIC has said that its assessment of reports of misconduct affecting small businesses is aimed at identifying cases to enable identification of possible test cases where misconduct may be harming the interests of small business and where it will provide certainty and fairness to all small business. Approximately 96% <coughs> of all Australian companies and businesses registered with ASIC are small businesses, being defined as those with fewer than 20 employees. In March 2017, ASIC established an Office of Small Business intended to increase ASIC's focus on and engagement with the small business sector. ASIC's new small business strategy, introduced in August 2017, will require all ASIC internal teams to assess how their work might affect small businesses. In a submission to the Commission, ASIC has observed concerns about the conduct of banks in providing small business finance since the GFC particularly in relation to the enforcement of loans by banks during and following the crisis. 
as we have already said, in early 2017, ASIC collaborated with the Small Business Ombudsman to review and consult with banks following the November 2016 extension of the unfair contract term provisions under the ASIC Act to small businesses. In its recent 2018 report, ASIC details the changes made by the big four banks to their small business loan contracts to comply with the legislation. As the competition regulator, the ACCC has a role in competition across all industries, including the financial services sector. While the ACCC's role is to enforce the Competition and Consumer Act, ASIC is the agency responsible for enforcing consumer protection laws in relation to financial products and services, and the ACCC generally refers such matters to ASIC. The unfair contract terms regime is incorporated into both the Australian Consumer Law and the ASIC Act. The enforcement of the Australian Consumer Law is the responsibility of the ACCC. In anticipation of the extension of the unfair contract terms provisions to small business taking effect on 12 November 2016, the ACCC undertook an education campaign beginning in November 2015, which included consultation with stakeholders. The 2017 ACCC Compliance and Enforcement Policy lists ensuring small business receives the protections of the new unfair contract terms law as an area of work it is prioritising. These efforts of the ACCC to date have obviously enough not focused on the issue of lending to small businesses because that is within the remit of ASIC rather than the ACCC. The Financial Ombudsman Service deals with around 83% of all disputes brought by consumers and small businesses within the current three schemes of external dispute resolution. In 2016-17, 1,431 disputes were brought to FOS by small businesses in relation to credit issues, which represented a high watermark for these types of disputes being brought to FOS. In its 2013 independent review report, FOS noted a number of common issues that affect small businesses, including maladministration and lending, fees and interest rate disputes, financial difficulty and issues pertaining to the realisation of security. FOS provided data to the Commission including an overview of what it termed its systemic issues investigations. These issues are those that FOS considers will have an effect on people beyond the parties involved in a dispute. The FOS submissions no notes that since 2017, 2008, 39 systemic issues have been identified in relation to business <coughs> finance. For business finance, the largest number of systemic issues relates to policies for dealing with customers in financial difficulty. We will hear from one of the Ombudsmen during these hearings in respect of a case involving a finding of irresponsible lending. The Commission published background paper number nine, the regulatory capital framework for authorised deposit taking institutions by the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority on 27 April 2018. It provides a great deal of detail on the regulatory capital framework and is available on the Commission's website. The Commission has also published on Friday the 18th of May 2018 a further background paper from APRA, background paper number 13, on impairment provisioning and enforcing of security. We will return to that second paper later. The capital adequacy framework has an effect on the costs and conditions of SME lending and on the types of security guarantees that are needed to secure this type of lending. Capital adequacy requirements are based on the framework developed by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which is the primary global standard setter for the prudential regulation of banks. Assessing capital requirements by financial institutions on the basis of these requirements involves categorising assets into separate classes and weighing their value according to their relative riskiness. Assets weighed in this way are referred to as risk-weighted assets. <coughs> The capital adequacy framework requires that a bank hold a minimum amount of regulatory capital as a proportion of its total risk-weighted assets. In its first background paper, APRA identifies that under the current regulatory framework, loans to small and medium enterprise businesses, which are secured by a residential property, receive the same capital treatment as consumer loans secured by residential property. That is, they attract the same risk weights as consumer loans. However, loans to SMEs which are secured by other forms of collateral, including by commercial property, are treated differently. Such loans are currently risk weighted at 100%. In February 2018, APRA commenced a consultation on proposed changes to the capital adequacy framework 
In relation to small business lending, the discussion paper released by APRA contains a proposal to change the risk weight requirements for SME lending, with SMEs being rele relevantly defined as a business that has annual group sales of less than $50 million. Under the new approach, APRA is proposing to reduce the risk weight attached to SME loans secured by commercial property and SME loans which are not secured by either residential or commercial property from 100% to between 60 and 85%. If implemented, this proposal will have the effect of reducing the minimum amount of regulatory capital which must be held by banks against lending to SMEs. APRA is also proposing to change the risk weightings for SME loans that are secured by residential property to attract the same risk weights as for interest-only loans and loans to purchase investment property from between 35 to 75 per cent to between 30 to 85 per cent, depending on the loan-to-value ratio. Treasury has noted in background paper number 11 that any additional constraints on the ability of a bank to realise collateral held against SME exposures as a result of legislation or additional protections for SME borrowers could have an effect on the amount of regulatory capital required by authorised deposit-taking institutions, and that may in turn have pricing implications. We turn now, Commissioner, to consider other important inquiries that have considered issues facing small businesses in respect of financial services providers. At the outset, we should explain that our discussion of this topic today is limited by parliamentary privilege, which means that evidence given to parliamentary inquiries cannot lawfully be adduced into evidence before this Commission, nor can statements, submissions or comments be made in relation to that evidence. For that reason, we will not address today the reports of various parliamentary inquiries. We will begin then with the Treasury consultation in relation to the unfair contract terms regime. The regime was extended to small businesses with effect from November 2016, but was preceded by a 2014 Treasury consultation. Over 80 submissions were received in response to the consultation, as well as around 300 responses to the online business survey. The majority of submissions were supportive of extending unfair contract term protections to small businesses including small business groups such as the Tasmanian Small Business Council and the Victorian Small Business Commissioner. A notable opponent of extending unfair contract term provisions was the ABA, which expressed the strong view that standard form contracts for the provision of financial services to small businesses by banks should be exempt from any extension of unfair contract term protections, including because this could have an effect on compliance costs for financial institutions and flow-on effects for access to credit. Nonetheless, these protections were extended to small business in November 2016. The Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman was established in March 2016 to assist and advocate for small business and family enterprises. In December 2016, the Ombudsman published her report into the adequacy of the law and practices governing financial lending. In this report, the Ombudsman observed that sudden changes in support by banks on agreed lending strategies with small business borrowers can result in the borrower not having sufficient time to seek alternative arrangements. Moreover, banks' unrealistic timeframes for debt reduction can force the SME borrower to restructure or downsize their business operations, which ultimately renders the business commercially unsustainable. The Ombudsman's recommendations included the strengthening of the ABA's six-point plan of measures designed to assist or ensure that member banks meet the expectations of their customers and the community, approval and administration of the revised code of banking practice by ASIC, a minimum 30-day business notice period to all changes to general restriction clauses and covenants, to give small business borrowers more time to respond and react to potential breach of conditions, and at least 90 days notice on decisions relating to the rollover of loans so that borrowers can organise alternative financing if loans are not renewed by their bank. The Ombudsman has also recently published reports into the transparency and disclosure practices of fintech lenders and the barriers to investment that face small to medium enterprises. The Ombudsman's inquiry into affordable capital for SME growth will be published later this year. On 20 April 2016, the Australian Government commissioned a review 
into the Financial System External Dispute Resolution and Complaints Framework, led by Professor Ian Ramsey, Julie Abr Abramson and Alan Kirkland. The final report of the review panel was published on 9 May 2017. The review panel found that while small businesses can access advice and advocacy services from small business specific organisations, such as the Small Business Ombudsman, these bodies are unable to provide comprehensive dispute resolution procedures, which small business requires. The review panel made various recommendations as to monetary limits and compensation caps, and the establishment of AFCA and its jurisdiction and compensation caps will reflect the recommendations that were made by the Ramsey Review. Under the Corporations Act, under the amendments to the Corporations Act, ASIC may direct AFCA to require that the limit on the value of claims that may be able to be made under the scheme and the limits on the value of remedies that AFCA may determine under the scheme be increased. AFCA's jurisdiction will also permit complaints in relation to non-monetary covenants to be heard. For disputes about whether a guarantee should be set aside where it has been supported by a mortgage or other security over the guarantor's primary place of residence, there will be no monetary limits or compensation caps. Commissioner, the eighth topic we will address this morning will be issues arising from the takeover of Bankwest by CBA in 2008. A number of former customers of Bankwest have made public submissions to the Royal Commission concerning their treatment after Bankwest was acquired by CBA. We will have case studies next week that concern actions taken with respect to customers of Bankwest after that acquisition. The relevant customers were reviewed as part of what is referred to as Project Magellan, an internal project of CBA. Those case studies will, we anticipate, allow you to consider the exercise by the bank of its contractual rights in circumstances in which it wish, wished to mitigate the risk to itself of exposure to a particular loan or lending to a particular industry. To return to the second overarching question that I flagged at the outset, the case studies will be relevant to the question of in what circumstances, if any, the exercise of contractual rights by a bank might be unfair, unconscionable or below community standards. The case studies that we have chosen do not raise any of the ulterior motive theories that have circulated from time to time about CBA's dealings with the Bankwest loan book. There are various ulterior motive theories and they are not consistent with each other. However, the common element is that they attribute to CBA in its dealings with the Bankwest loan book an ulterior motive to systematically default loans and to default loans for reasons not concerned with what CBA perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be the risk of a particular loan or lending to a particular industry. Outside of these hearings, significant work has been undertaken by the Commission to look at the history of the raising of various ulterior motive theories, their consideration or the consideration of those theories in other forums, and the extent to which there is any evidence to support them. In consultation with you, we have made the decision that none of these ulterior motive theories warrant further consideration by case studies during these hearings. We will say a little more about two of those theories to illustrate the consideration that has been undertaken. But before I turn to those two theories, it will be helpful to provide some factual context to the acquisition of Bankwest by CBA in December 2008. In 2003, a UK bank, HBOS, acquired Bankwest. Bankwest had been the state bank in Western Australia. In the years that followed Bankwest's acquisition by HBOS, Bankwest was heavily dependent on funding from its UK-based parent. In 2008, HBOS found itself exposed to the global financial crisis. Indeed, in mid-September 2008, Lloyds announced a proposal to acquire HBOS with the UK government to take a 40% stake in the merged entity. At around that time, HBOS determined to sell Bank West. On 8 October 2008, CBA entered into the sale agreement by which it purchased Bank West for an initial purchase price of $2.1 billion, which was to be paid on 19 December 2008. The sale agreement set out a purchase price adjustment process. 
by the relevant provisions, the initial price paid by CBA for Bank West could increase or decrease by reference to the financial accounts which were to be prepared for Bank West as at 19 December 2008. Any adjustment was the subject of a process by which HBOS was to provide its calculations and, in the absence of agreement, there was to be a resolution of disputes and finalisation of the adjustment by expert determination. After receiving the relevant financial information from HBOS, CBA disputed certain items and the matter eventually proceeded to be determined by an expert in accordance with the contractual process. Ernst and Young were appointed as the expert for this purpose. Pursuant to the process, on 19 February 2009, HBOS had provided a draft completion balance sheet for Bankwest as at 19 December 2008. The draft balance sheet was accompanied by price adjustment calculations and an unqualified audit report from KPMG. CBA was required to give notice to HBOS that it either agreed or disagreed with the content of the draft balance sheet and the price adjustment calculations by 20 April 2009. It did so and identified 22 items in the balance sheet with which it disagreed. There followed a process of negotiation before Ernst & Young was instructed on 5 June 2009 to resolve the disputed items. While initially there were 22 disputed items, by the time Ernst & Young came to make its determination, some had been resolved. Ernst & Young received further submissions from each of HBOS and CBA as to the still disputed items. On 7 July 2009, Ernst & Young completed its determination. The result was an increase in the price paid by CBA of $26 million. The final price for Bank West was therefore $2.126 billion. The net increase of $26 million took into account price increases and decreases arising from the disputed items. Only two of the 22 disputed items related to impairment of loans. One was to specific provisions and the other to general provision. Taken just by themselves, the two items relating to impairment of loans accounted for a $156.6 million price decrease, but they were more than netted out by other items that ultimately increased the price. The first ulterior motive theory that I will address in a little detail is what is often referred to as the clawback allegation. The clawback ulterior motive theory is that CBA acted deliberately after it acquired Bankwest to impair some loans so that it could claw back the amount of the impairment from HBOS under the price adjustment mechanism. For reasons that I will explain in a moment, this, this ulterior motive theory is not supported by either the facts or the operation of the contractual mechanism. However, before I come to the Commission's own analysis, I wish to say some things about the views that have been expressed by others who have looked at this particular theory. As I've already said, by reason of parliamentary privilege, it is not appropriate to say anything about the treatment of such theories in reports of any parliamentary committees. However, the clawback allegation has been referred to in court proceedings. In 2013, Justice Hammerschlag of the New South Wales Supreme Court delivered a judgment in the matter of international skin care suppliers and Commonwealth Bank of Australia. During the course of that proceeding, allegations were made that CBA had dishonestly defaulted a loan motivated by the clawback provisions in the sale agreement with HBOS. The relevant borrower had gone into voluntary administration on 3 February 2009, and Bankwest ultimately appointed a receiver on 11 December 2009. CBA had not sought any further provision in respect of that borrower as part of the price adjustment process. That is, this loan had not even been subject to the clawback mechanism. The plaintiff abandoned the clawback allegations during the course of the proceeding. Nevertheless, His Honour addressed the abandoned allegations in his judgment and concluded there was no proper basis for the charges of dishonesty against the bank or its officers which were levelled in the clawback arrangement claim it is difficult to see how the view could properly have been formed that there was any basis for the allegations they should not have been made. The clawback allegations also appear to have been raised and then abandoned in another proceeding in the New South Wales Supreme Court, which is Neil and Bank of Western Australia Limited. In that case, also before Justice Hamishlag, His Honour noted that the plaintiff informed him that he, the plaintiff, 
had read Justice Hammerschlag's judgment in international skin care and the plaintiff had concluded that Justice Hammerschlag was correct. The plaintiff had thereafter run a different claim as to CBA's motives, described as the deliberate destruction strategy, which was also rejected by Justice Hammerschlag. Staying with the clawback ulterior motive theory, this has also been considered by the Small Business Ombudsman. We have engaged with the Ombudsman. The view that she has expressed in writing to the Commission about the clawback ulterior motive theory is unequivocal. She describes it as false and explains that, in her view, there was no capacity in the share sale deed for a clawback of performing loans that were present in acquisition and which post-acquisition became impaired. Based on our own analysis, we share the views of the Ombudsman that the clawback ulterior motive theory is incorrect. I will summarise only some of the relevant matters that might have been misunderstood about the facts and the contractual mechanism. First, the price adjustment mechanism in the sale agreement was concerned with the state of Bankwest's accounts as at 19 December 2008. For an adjustment to be made to the purchase price based on the provisioning of an impaired loan, it meant that provision or further provision for the loan ought to have ma been made in the accounts as at 19 December 2008, but the amount of provision provided for in HBOS's draft balance sheet on 19 February 2009 was inadequate. Merely calling in a loan after 19 December 2008 could not affect the state of facts as at 19 December 2008. Secondly, it is important to understand the difference between four terms, impairment, provisioning, default and enforcement. The terms have sometimes, unfortunately, been used inaccurately in documents that we have seen and in a way that leads to misunderstandings. Perhaps most significantly, the term impairment is sometimes used as if it is synonymous with default or enforcement. It is not. A loan is impaired if there are doubts about whether the bank will recover the full amount of money owed by the borrower to the bank. A borrower may be up to date on payments, but the loan may nevertheless be impaired because there are doubts about timely and full repayment. On the other hand, a borrower may be behind on payments, but the loan is not impaired because the bank has sufficient security to cover the full amount of the loan. If a bank forms a view that a loan is impaired, then it ought to make a provision to cover its expected shortfall in recovery from the loan. It should hold a provision against the estimated loss. This will be recorded on the bank's balance sheet. Impairment and provisioning are separate and distinct from default and enforcement. In perhaps overly simplistic terms, impairment and provisioning are concerned with the bank's management of its capital adequacy and balance sheet. Default and enforcement are concerned with the relationship between the bank and the borrower. A default means that there has been some breach of the loan contract by the borrower. Enforcement action is some action taken by the bank, such as the appointment of a receiver and manager or the commencement of a court proceeding based on the default. As we have just explained, it is possible that a borrower is not in default, but nevertheless the bank must treat the relevant loan as impaired because the bank is ultimately unlikely to recover the full amount it has loaned to the borrower. Conversely, a borrower might be in default, but the loan is not impaired and no provision needs to be made because the bank has sufficient security. Once the distinction between these terms is understood, the difficulty with the suggestion that CBA and Bankwest were defaulting loans after 19 December 2008 in order to render them impaired as at 19 December 2008 becomes immediately apparent. Thirdly, most of the complaints that we have seen have been by Bankwest customers about their treatment by CBA or Bankwest in respect of events that occurred after 7 July 2009 and in fact in 2010 or later. That was the situation being addressed by Justice Hammerschlag in international skin care. Yet the clawback ulterior motive theory cannot have anything to do with events after 7 July 2009 because after that date, on that date, Ernst & Young had delivered their determination and the price adjustment mechanism had no more work to do. Fourthly, a review of the process in relation to the price adjustment mechanism does not support the ulterior motive theory. For the one disputed item concerned with provision for specific loans, there were 67 loans that CBA said ought to have been provisioned for or further provisioned for as at 19 December 2008 which had not been provisioned or adequately provisioned for in the HBOS draft balance sheet. Of these, once CBA raised the issue, 
HBOS ultimately agreed that seven should be provisioned in the full amount sought by CBA. 60 remained in dispute, but of these 60 in dispute, HBOS agreed that 18 should be provisioned in part of the amount sought by CBA. We have reviewed the submissions made by CBA and the Ernst & Young determination. On our review of the 67 loans identified by CBA as requiring additional provision, in many of them, receivers and managers had been appointed prior to 19 December 2008. There had been significant monetary defaults prior to 19 December 2008. Guarantees had declared bankruptcy or were in liquidation prior to 19 December 2008 or the loan file was already under credit management prior to 19 December 2008. On any view, these were already distressed loans. By way of example, in one case, receivers and managers had been appointed in 2007 to a property development group with three incomplete residential and industrial developments. As at 19 December 2008, the receivers and managers had completed and sold off two developments but there were various complications and costs associated with completion and sale of the third. The guarantors had been declared bankrupt. There was no disagreement between CBA and HBOS, unsurprisingly, that the loan was impaired. The only dispute was as to the amount of provision. CBA sought an increase in provision and HBOS ultimately accepted this increased provision. Our review also suggested that in respect of only a few of these loans, did CBA point to the appointment of receivers and managers between 19 December 2008 and the EY determination in its submissions to Ernst & Young. That said, even where it did so, it was not necessarily the case that CBA had sought to rely on those appointments as evidence that the loan should have been impaired at 19 December 2008. In one case, Ernst & Young agreed with CBA that there was sufficient evidence that the loan was impaired at 19 December 2008, but there was a workout strategy in place at that time and therefore no specific provision was required. The appointment of receivers and managers, while noted by Ernst & Young, was not relevant to their determination. In another case, the decision to appoint receivers and managers in February 2009 was made only after the borrower advised CBA of a winding up order that it did not intend to defend. CBA and HBOS agreed that the facility was impaired at 19 December 2008. The disagreement was as to the amount of the specific provision. Ultimately, Ernst & Young's determination was closer to CBA's figure. CBA referred in its submissions to the appointment of a receiver and it would seem that CBA's figures as to the amount of provision was based on its assessment of the security value as well as realisation costs, which included some receivership costs and hence the reference to the receiver and manager. In the third case, processes were already underway to appoint receivers and managers and take possession of the relevant property as at 19 December 2008. After acquisition, the receivers were appointed and the property sold. HBOS ultimately agreed with CBA's proposed specific provision, so Ernst & Young was not required to make any determination. In a couple of other cases determined by Ernst & Young, CBA pointed to, its, pointed to action taken as mortgagee in possession after 19 December 2008. In one case, as at 19 December 2008, the borrower could not be located and had already declared bankruptcy. CBA entered into the property as mortgagee in possession in March 2009 and the property was sold in April 2009. There was no disagreement that the loan was impaired. HBOS agreed with CBA's proposed specific provision which reflected the shortfall between the amount of loan exposure and the sale price. Again, Ernst & Young was not required to determine the provision. In another case, there was no disagreement that a loan was impaired at 19 December 2008 as the borrower, a hotel proprietor, had been declared bankrupt on 18 December 2008. CBA entered the property as mortgagee in possession in February 2009 and the property was sold. HBOS and CBA differed by a couple of hundred thousand dollars as to the amount of provision and ultimately EY adopted the figure proposed by HBOS. Finally, for one other loan, CBA pointed to default notices to argue that a loan was impaired at 19 December 2008. Ernst & Young determined that the borrower was not in technical default at 19 December 2008, even though the borrower subsequently failed to repay the $16.72 million facility when it fell due in January 2009. As a result, the loan was not impaired or provisioned as part of the price adjustment mechanism. In summary, none of the foregoing 
of the analysis that we've just gone through is consistent with CBA seeking to systematically default borrowers and take enforcement action against those 67 borrowers so as to rely upon the price adjustment mechanism. Commissioner, the second ulterior motive theory that I will mention is one that CBA impaired loans on the Bankwest loan book to improve its tier one capital ratio. There are various permutations of this theory and the one example that we will deal with today has the following elements. The board of CBA resolved in February 2009 to lift its internal tier one capital ratio target to above 7% from a previous range of between 6.5% and 7%. This created pressure on CBA management to improve its tier one capital ratio. CBA did not wish to raise capital to improve its capital ratio. Therefore, CBA impaired or wrote off loans to improve its capital ratio. These elements arise from a misunderstanding of a number of matters. First, CBA did not need to improve its tier one capital ratio to get it above 7% as at February 2009. Its tier one capital ratio was already well above 7% as at that date. At our request, APRA has prepared a table setting out the tier one capital ratios of the big four banks and Bankwest until it was absorbed into CBA over the period from 30 June 2008 to 30 July 2015. And we'll bring that up now, it's RCD dot quadruple nine dot zero zero three zero dot triple zero one. And consistently with what I have just said, you will see Commissioner that as at December 2008, CBA had a tier one capital ratio of 8.4%. Indeed, it was the highest of the big four banks at that time. And you will also see that the final figure under Bank West for that same period, period was a ratio of 7.5%. There was no need, as at February 2009, for CBA to engage in any process in relation to its business loan book to improve its tier one capital ratio to bring it above 7%. It was already well above that ratio. Attend to that table, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.1 will be tier one capital ratios, June 08 to June 15, RCD 9999 0030 Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Secondly, CBA was not avoiding raising capital to improve its tier one capital ratio at the relevant time. Indeed, it raised significant amounts of capital and that is publicly disclosed in CBA's capital adequacy and risk disclosures. They demonstrate that CBA raised significant amounts of tier one capital as follows. CBA issued $405 million and $688 million of ordinary shares in March and September 2009, respectively, to satisfy the dividend reinvestment plans. CBA issued $865 million of ordinary shares in March 2009 with respect to a share purchase plan. CBA issued $2 billion of Pearl's five securities in October 2009, which by reason of regulatory rules, $1.6 billion was eligible for inclusion in the bank's tier one capital. Thirdly, and most significantly, impairing and provisioning a loan does not improve a bank's tier one capital ratio. Rather, it reduces the bank's tier one capital ratio. As we mentioned earlier, we sought a paper from APRA explaining how impairment, provisioning and enforcement of loans affects the tier one capital ratio. That was published on the Commission's website on Friday. The consequence of systematically impairing loans would be to reduce the tier one capital ratio. There's also been some suggestion that a write-off of a loan might improve the bank's tier one capital ratio. What that means exactly is unclear. A bank's capital position does not improve by writing off assets. In any event, a write-off happens at the end of an enforcement process. And as we will see with a document we'll bring up in a moment, almost all of the relevant completion of enforcement action and writing off of loans in the Bankwest loan book occurred on or after 1 July 2010. Can we bring up CBA.0001.0032.0490? And if we go to the second page of that document and blow up the chart at the bottom of the page, 
you'll see, Commissioner, this is a chart explaining the amounts of write-offs that occurred in relation to what was defined as the performing book as at December 2008. The performing book just means that part of the book that was not impaired and provisioned for as at December 2008. And you will see that although there is a limited number of write-offs in financials years 2009 and 2010, there are then significant write-offs in 2011, 2012 and 2013 and 2014 and 2015. Attend to that document, Commissioner. How do I describe it, Mr Hodge? Uh, it can be described, Commissioner, well, strictly it's a letter that was originally produced by the Commonwealth Bank to the Parliamentary Joint Committee, but in fact it's now been produced in various ways so that it doesn't attract Letter CBA privilege. dated? The 10th of November 2015. Uh, 10 November 15, uh, CBA treble zero one double zero three two zero four nine zero becomes exhibit three point two. Thank you, Commissioner. In summary, we have not seen any primary evidence from primary sources that support these ulterior motive theories, and their logic appears to be premised on misconceptions of the facts to which we have referred. For that reason, they will not be pursued as part of the case studies. Can we add one final observation? There is a hidden vice in these types of theories, which is that they create a distraction from the substantive questions that are worthy of further consideration. They allow the convenience of avoiding grappling with the risk presented by a particular borrower or industry. They therefore avoid asking how a bank might or might not legitimately respond to its perception of increased risk in respect of a particular loan or lending in a particular industry and in what circumstances such conduct might be unconscionable or below community standards. And the view that we have formed is that if we do not ask the right questions, then we cannot hope to assist you to arrive at the right answers. The ninth topic that we will address is information provided to us by financial services entities about whether their own conduct in relation to small businesses has constituted misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. As you know, Commissioner, you have written to various entities in the financial services in industry and related representative bodies and asked them to address a number of questions. You invited each of those entities to identify any misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations that it had engaged in since 1 January 2008. After receiving responses in late January, Commissioner, you wrote to a number of those entities again and asked them to provide more specific information about instances of misconduct in the past five years. A further request, specific to small businesses, was sent to ANZ, Bank of Queensland, CBA, Macquarie Bank, NAB and Westpac on the 5th of April 2018, asking whether there was any feature of those earlier responses that those entities wished to point to as relating to SME lending and inviting those entities to add to their responses specifically in relation to SME lending. That further request was sent by the solicitor assisting the Commission. We will deal with the responses from the entities that will be giving evidence in these hearings in alphabetical order. ANZ has provided three submissions to the Commission, the last one of which is specific to SME lending. ANZ told the Commission that its SME lending is typically advanced to small to medium sized business customers with total business lending of up to $10 million. ANZ's small business banking team typically deals with customers who have total business lending of up to $1 million and its business banking team deals with customers who have total business lending of up to $10 million. <coughs> ANZ acknowledged that it engaged in misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to SME lending. We give some examples of ANZ's acknowledgements. First, ANZ acknowledged misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to applications for business loans. ANZ has identified instances where frontline staff engaged in inappropriate sales practices in an effort to increase incentive payments, including selling or referring customers to unsuitable products, some of which involved SME lending. ANZ identified instances where its staff or representatives 
were involved in submitting false information in connection with loans and loan applications. For example, ANZ acknowledged that in 2017, two ANZ business banking managers were found to have been colluding with external third parties to make 47 fraudulent loans. One was dismissed, the other resigned during the disciplinary process. ANZ also acknowledged misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to where business loan arrangements had been varied or come to an end. ANZ identified that, in some instances, dealings between its collection team and customers breached the Code of Banking Practice and the ASIC Debt Collection Guidelines. ANZ also identified concerns raised by the Financial Services Ombudsman of a systemic issue in failing to suspend collections activity once a dispute was before the Ombudsman, including in connection with SME lending. In identifying for the Commission what it considers community standards and expectations are in relation to SME lending, ANZ told the Commission that there are important points of differences between the expectations of consumer lending and SME lending, stating that there is a community expectation of greater flexibility and approach with regard to SME lending. ANZ cites the desirability of entrepreneurial enterprise and economic growth in the SME sector, as well as differences in regulatory regimes and protections as reasons why this is the case. This difference in approach is reflected in ANZ's policies in relation to SME lending. For example, ANZ told the Commission that its policies and procedures do not specifically address the taking of security over personal assets, such as a family home, rather the principles applicable to all forms of security apply to these types of guarantees. Next, we come to Bank of Queensland. Bank of Queensland provided two submissions to the Commission, including one specific to SME lending. Bank of Queensland has identified the following in relation to applications for business loans. Following the initiation of a product review program, a number of issues were identified relating to the incorrect charging of fees and interests, fees and interest, which also affected business customers. Instances in which guarantees for SME loans were taken from and sought to be enforced against guarantors who claimed not to have understood the effect of the guarantee or their waiver of independent legal advice, including where guarantees were given by relatives of the SME borrower, and instances prior to the implementation of risk framework developments and enhancements in 2012, in which a complaint has been made concerning BOQ's assessment of the ability of an SME borrower to service an SME loan. Bank of Queensland has also identified the following circumstances where business loan arrangements have been varied or come to an end. Instances in which it did not provide an extensive period of notice before taking a action against a borrower in default, giving rise to complaints about the adequacy of the notice provided, and instances in which it did not provide an extensive period of notice of the expiry of a small or medium enterprise facility, giving rise to complaints about the adequacy of that notice. In identifying these instances, Bank of Queensland stated that the bona fide reliance on contractual terms should not be seen as conduct falling below community standards and expectations. Approximately 3,200 external dispute resolution cases involving FOS have been taken against Bank of Queensland in the period 2009 to 2017, some of which have included complaints by SME lending customers which were resolved in favour of the borrower. Nevertheless, Bank of Queensland told the Commission that it does not consider that it has identified any systemic problems in the conduct of its SME lending business. We turn now to the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. CBA provided four submissions to the Commission, including one specific to SME lending. CBA told the Commission that it undertakes SME lending primarily through the Business and Private Banking Business Unit and, to a lesser extent, the Retail Banking Services Business Unit. Business lending is also provided by Bank West as a business unit of CBA. CBA has identified instances in which customers have raised concerns in relation to applications for business loans. The first is in respect of two decisions of the Supreme Court of Victoria and the Victorian Court of Appeal in relation to Doggett, Commonwealth Bank of Australia and Doggett, and Doggett and Commonwealth Bank of Australia.
in which the court ruled, both at first instance and on appeal, that CBA had breached clause 25 of the then Code of Banking Practice and that the guarantors in that case were not bound by a guarantee provided to CBA as part of a business facility because CBA had not exercised due care and skill in its credit assessment of the borrower. CBA also identified in its risk insight data 59 instances of provision of a business lending product for a potentially ineligible purpose, which do not comply with a policy or business rule, 17 instances of inadequate or inaccurate disclosure being made to customers in relation to an SME lending product, and 16 instances relating to loan conditions, including servicing. CBA has also identified instances in which customers have raised concerns relating to account management. CBA identified 25 incidents in its risk insight data relating to fee and interest inaccuracy, including some incidents that involve multiple customers. For example, on 6 October 2017, FOS notified CBA of a systemic issue in overdraft double debit interest being charged on business transaction accounts on both overdrafts and simple business overdrafts. The defect was first identified by CBA in 2013 with manual remediation being carried out until 2015 when it was thought a systemic fix had been put in place. Additional cases relating to the systemic defect were identified as a result of the FOS dispute in 2016 and an enhanced system fix was introduced in 2017. In total, CBA has refunded $2.7 million in relation to the issue. The Small Business Ombudsman has written to CBA a letter requesting CBA's rationale for not reporting this issue to ASIC as a significant breach. We are aware that CBA has now reported this issue to ASIC as a significant breach, and one of the case studies that you will hear, Commissioner, will be concerned with this issue. CBA has also notified the Commission of a recent incident in which it was identified that CBA and Bankwest merchant customers may have been charged fees for merchant facilities provided to them, despite the customers not using or ceasing to use those facilities. CBA has notified ASIC of this issue and is continuing to investigate. CBA further acknowledged concerns where business loan arrangements had been varied or come to an end. CBA provided details of 24 cases where FOS had a view adverse to CBA including business customers experiencing financial difficulty. CBA acknowledged that the experience of one customer who had made a submission to the loan impairment inquiry conducted by the Parliamentary Joint Committee had been poor. The submissions provided by CBA identified that since 2010, there have been 196 cases involving CBA and FOS relating to business finance or SME lending issues, with FOS having a view adverse to CBA in 86 of those cases. We turn now to the National Australia Bank. NAB provided three submissions to the Commission, including one specific to SME lending. NAB did not aggregate instances of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to SME lending, instead identifying 180 events recorded in their internal risk smart reports relevant to business lending. A review of those events identified by NAB illustrate the following issues being raised on multiple occasions. First, incorrect disclosure of interest rates and interest calculated incorrectly, resulting in clients being overcharged. Secondly, duplication and incorrect disclosure of fees. Thirdly, defects with the provision of customer and guarantor consent, including consent forms missing from files or being provided after a loan had been granted or consent received after application, and fourthly, failure to complete credit checks. In relation to applications for business loans, NAB acknowledged the following specific instances of misconduct in relation to SME lending. In 2015, in NAB and Rice and NAB and Rose, the Victorian Supreme Court found that NAB failed to give a customer prominent notice of, a cer of certain matters before execution of the guarantees, including that the customer ought to seek independent legal and financial advice. NAB also identified in 2016-17, as part of a program to review Code of Banking Practice Compliance, 
that it may not be able to evidence that appropriate warnings and disclosures to guarantors have been made in compliance with Clause 31 of the Code. This matter was reported by NAB to the Code Compliance and Monitoring Committee in its annual compliance statements. The Code Compliance and Monitoring Committee found that NAB had breached the Code of Banking practice when procuring guarantees prior to 2016. Suncorp has provided two submissions to the Commission, which admitted to instances of conduct falling below community standards and expectations, two of which relate to, bank, to business banking. Between 14 November 2015 and 10 March 2016, Suncorp failed to issue approximately 54,000 system-generated letters to retail and small business loan customers due to human error. This affected approximately 31,000 individual accounts. Suncorp reported this as a breach of the National Consumer Credit Code to ASIC on 14 March 2016 and provided a further update on, April, on 8 April 2016. On 13 December 2016, Suncorp agreed to ASIC issuing 20 infringement notices with a non-negotiable penalty of $270,000 to resolve the matter. In 2015, an error was identified in relation to Suncorp systems and controls that resulted in a business banking error relating to a margin loan facility, which exposed the borrowers to an approximately $4 million margin call. Finally, we turn to Westpac. Westpac has made seven submissions to the Commission. The Business Bank Division of Westpac is responsible for providing lending products and services to micro, small and medium enterprises and commercial business customers. Business lending through this typically extends to the provision of lending products of facilities from under $250,000 to $20 million. Although there are some cases where customers have facilities over that level, the Business Bank Division categorises levels of lending broadly as follows less than $250,000 is considered micro SME lending, up to $300 million is SME lending, and above $3 million is commercial lending. Business lending is provided under the Westpac, St George, Bank SA, Bank of Melbourne, and Capital Finance Australia brands. In relation to applications for business loans, Westpac recently identified examples where business bank customers, customer loans for personal purposes may have been offered and credit assessed as a business loan when they should have been offered and assessed as loans within the scope of the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. Westpac is in the process of identifying <coughs> the scope of the issue and has engaged with ASIC. Westpac acknowledged the following in relation to where business loan arrangements had been varied or come to an end. First, issues relating to collection functions performed by Westpac and third parties on Westpac's behalf including three instances of inappropriate enforcement action being taken against borrowers. Secondly, incidents where it did not verify the customer's financial information, did not appropriately test serviceability, did not follow appropriate process in meeting the customer face-to-face, -face, or made errors in the origination of loans in the incorrect stream. Thirdly, several FOS cases identified that on occasion, Westpac has failed to properly consider or respond to a customer's notification to the bank about their financial distress. This resulted in Westpac continuing with enforcement action rather than working with the customer. Westpac has recently identified 98 instances of matters being referred to external dispute resolution related to business banking in material that was submitted to the Commission on about 17 May 2018. Commissioner, the 10th and final topic that we will address as part of this opening are the case studies which are to be explored in this round of hearings. This first week of hearings will focus predominantly on the conduct of financial services entities in connection with applications for business loans and the approach of the entities to hardship. The issues to be explored include how banks assess such loans and whether such practices meet community standards and expectations. We also will consider case studies where potential financial abuse was apparent and we explore what community expectations are enlivened in such situations, including where spouses or family members find themselves as co-debtors or guarantors.
The first case study concerns Ms Caroline Flanagan, who provided a personal guarantee and mortgage to Westpac in relation to a business loan taken out by her daughter and daughter's partner. Westpac sought to repossess Ms Flanagan's home after the borrower was defaulted on the loan. Ms Flanagan and her legal aid solicitor will give evidence to the Commission about the taking of the guarantee and security from Ms Flanagan and what happened when they pursued a complaint in FOS. The next three case studies relate to the entry into loans for the purposes of purchasing franchise businesses. The first of those concerns business credit facilities provided by ANZ in relation to the purchase of a gelato franchise. ANZ will give evidence about its approach to the assessment of the serviceability of the loan and the profitability of the business. In the second of those case studies, a borrower will give evidence about Westpac's assessment of the suitability of a loan provided for the purposes of purchasing a pie face franchise and the effect on her financial well-being when the franchise failed. In the third of those case studies, a borrower will give evidence about the credit assessment undertaken by Bank of Queensland in relation to her entering into a business loan to purchase two franchises in a shopping centre in Adelaide. All three of these case studies will allow the exploration of the approach of banks to assessing the suitability of a business loan and the potential profitability of a business, particularly where personal assets are used to secure the loan. The fifth case study concerns the provision by CBA of business overdraft facilities, and in particular it's charging a number of clients double interest on those facilities for a period of time. This case study will explore this misconduct, its discovery by CBA, the approach to remediation of affected customers and the conduct of CBA generally in relation to this issue. The sixth case study relates to the grant of a residential loan to a business borrower by Westpac which was subsequently discovered to have created a security shortfall. This case study considers whether the bank's conduct in seeking to rectify, I'm sorry, this case study considers the bank's conduct in seeking to rectify the security shortfall by withholding funds obtained through the borrower's sale of a separate property. The seventh case study concerns a family affected by various debts to Suncorp on the death of the father. One of the loans was a business loan which FOS determined had been irresponsibly made by Suncorp. The case considers Suncorp's conduct following the FOS determination, as well as the FOS process and outcomes for applicants who have received a loan that was irresponsibly approved by a bank. Evidence will be heard not only from a family member and from Suncorp, but also from one of FOS's ombudsmen. The second week of hearings will turn to consider a number of cases in which small business arrangements with their banks have been varied or come to an end. As part of that, as I have mentioned, we will hear from some former Bank West customers about their experiences with that bank after the, after the bank's acquisition by CBA. This will include consideration of the relevance or effect of Project Magellan. Of those witnesses, the majority will be from the East Coast. Despite Bank West being a Perth-based bank, much of its business lending at the relevant time was, or the, much of the business lending of complaint at the relevant time was a consequence of its expansion onto the East Coast. And that is reflected in the composition of the witnesses from whom you will hear evidence. Next week we'll conclude with evidence concerning the new proposed banking code presently under consideration by ASIC and ASIC's implementation and enforcement of the unfair contract terms provisions in the ASIC Act once they are extended to small businesses in 2016. Commissioner, at the start of this opening, we outlined three overarching questions that we expect you will want to consider in the context of this module. These relate to responsible lending obligations with respect to small businesses, the exercise of contractual rights of enforcement by the bank and how banks and the regulator have responded to calls for tighter controls over dealings with small business. Underlying those overarching questions are many subsidiary questions which we think it might be useful to identify some of now. How do we define a small business for these purposes? What is the rationale for distinguishing between small business loans and other business loans? What meaningful difference in outcome would be expected if the requirements for lending to small businesses 
as distinct from the bank's compliance and application of existing requirements was changed? Should the obligations with respect to SME loans be adjusted to more closely reflect the obligations in relation to consumer loans, particularly where residential or other family assets are used to secure the loan? Would this result in any meaningful difference of outcome for small business customers or the guarantors? What is the right balance between protecting SME borrowers through regulation and not creating barriers to business financing? And what does the, com the community expect in this regard? Is the current policy setting for SME lending right, whereby there is minimal regulatory oversight of banks in relation to SME lending, and banks are effectively left to regulate in this space through the code of banking practice? How do significant power imbalances between the banks and SMEs in relation to lending affect the conditions for entry into and exit from these types of loans? How sophisticated and well-resourced can SME customers be expected to be in their dealings with banks? What is the right balance between banks being able to exercise their contractual rights to protect their commercial interests and those of their shareholders and creditors and their promise to act fairly and reasonably towards an SME in a consistent and ethical manner? Have banks responded effectively to relevant legislative changes, including the unfair contract terms provisions in the ASIC Act? What has been the regulator's role in implementing these changes? Are SMEs able to obtain efficient and cost-effective redress in their dispute with lenders? The case studies across the two weeks will collectively, we hope, present an opportunity to consider each of these questions. Commissioner, that concludes the opening address. Would it be convenient to have a 15 minute break we before? Come back at say uh, 11.40. Thank you, Commissioner. You say 15, I say 12. <laughs> okay.